Do you think I don't see what you're up to? At first glance, Jerry Seinfeld's 2007 magnum opus might be seen as mere capitalist propaganda, a fable wherein a naive and rebellious working class hero points out the injustices of an exploitative market, tries to liberate the labor force and seize the means of production, and in doing so creates a functionless, unsustainable welfare state that will die without returning to a status quo of proletariat oppression. However, as with any literary zeitgeist, in order to understand the film fully, we need to analyze it through the lens of historical, contextual exegesis. B-Movie was released on November 2nd, 2007, floating on the last wakes of the Bush administration's turbulent second term. The United States was in the middle of the Iraq War. The housing bubble was collapsing in the subprime mortgage crisis. Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth had released just a year prior. People were facing problems of their own making, like bees drowning slowly in honey, but many were unwilling to accept agency. What we needed was to be stung. One of the first and perhaps most significant interpretive clues given to us is the film's title, B-Movie. DreamWorks is no stranger to clever wordplay in its titles as evidenced by Shrek the Third, Shrek Forever After, and to a large extent Shark Tale, which is an anagram for Laat Shrek, which is Dutch for Late Shrek in reference to how the film not only takes place canonically after Shrek's death, but also centers thematically around the death of Shrek's ideals about identity acceptance and filial piety. B-movie, likewise, has a double meaning. Yes, it's a movie about bees, at least superficially. More importantly though, the title labels the film as a, quote, B-movie. This is significant. Firstly, the term B-movie immediately connotes mediocrity, a general lack of quality, a bad movie. While the film received mixed to negative reception, most, if not all, critics missed a core point. This was never intended to be a good movie. The film's mediocrity is an intentional element designed to draw your attention to the specific things that make it bad. B-movie is bad on purpose. But why? Why set out to make a film that seems bizarre, uncomfortable, unpleasant, or even tedious to watch? Why produce a film so ostensibly devoid of entertainment value and market it as a family comedy? And that brings us back to the significance of the title. What it really means to be a B-movie. Say, fellas, did somebody mention the door to darkness? The Oxford Dictionary defines a B-movie as, quote, a low-budget movie, especially one made for use as a companion to the main attraction in the double feature, end quote. B-movie was produced with a budget of 150 million U.S. dollars, costing as much to make as Mad Max Fury Road, Ready Player One, Doolittle, Dunkirk, The Matrix Reloaded, Doolittle, and G-Force. Approximately double the budgets of Madagascar, Lat Shrek, Dr. Doolittle, and Dr. Doolittle 2. This was hardly low budget, especially in 2007. More interestingly, among the three other films that released that day alongside B-Movie, American Gangster, Martian Child, and Darfur Now, none cost nearly as much. What then did Jerry Seinfeld's subversive masterpiece serve as a companion film to? What was the main attraction of this double feature? It couldn't have been another film, as B-Movie outspent and vastly outshone all others. And that being the case, there's only one plausible option. 
All Souls Day. Not only is November 2nd famous for being the release anniversary of one of the most controversial and critically examined animated films of all time, it is also a day in Catholic and Orthodox Christian traditions set aside to commemorate and pray for the departed souls in purgatory. According to Catholic doctrine, purgatory from the Latin purgatorium from purgare to purge is a state of expiatory purification a place where souls may be temporarily punished in order to be cleansed of their sin. A place for temporary punishment. A place of purification. A place where guilty souls are made ready for heaven. B-Movie is purgatory! Remember that this film was made intentionally to be off-putting, to be difficult to sit through, to be a bad movie. B-movie exists as a finite state of punishment. The theaters on November 2nd, 2007 became audiovisual chambers of expiatory suffering marketed towards families. This film was intended to reach all ages and tiers of society, to serve as a signpost for our guilt to turn us away from a path of destruction. The experience of watching B-Movie puts the viewer in a state of purgatory, which serves as the B-Movie companion to a collective lamentation for and consideration of lost souls in need of correction and purification. And what do we need to be corrected for? What was our sin? The Bush administration, global warming, the war on Iraq. Let's think about this for a second. Let's look at what makes B-Movie bad. The first thing that comes to mind is the humor. You like jazz? Despite being a comedy, the jokes consistently fall flat. How did you learn to do that? What? That, 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 the talking thing. Oh. Same way you did, I guess. Mama, dad, dad, honey, you pick it up. <laughs> That's very funny. Yeah, bees are funny. <laughs> we didn't laugh, we'd cry, but what we have to deal with. <laughs> anyway. Pulling the viewer lower into disappointment and eventually depression. But that's the point. Bee movie isn't funny. Are we bees or are we keychains? Keychains! No, we're bees! Hey, he's right. We are bees. Every apparent joke is a sobering stab in the oh. hand, waking you oh. up to the fact oh. that you're watching a movie. And outside of that movie, you are trapped in a reality you cannot wake up from without taking action. The people in the theater paid for laughter, for escapism. And Jerry Seinfeld answered their appeal by forcing them to confront the depths of their own psyches. Remember also that this film's negative critical reception was directed primarily towards its premise. We are made to suffer as we watch a bee, a member of an oppressed minority group not recognized for its equal dignity or humanity, enter the domain and lives of Vanessa and Kenny ultimately usurping Kenny's place within the apartment. You're trying to steal my girl. As well as his romantic relationship with Vanessa. Barry is portrayed as an invader, and Kenny serves as a manifest representation of American xenophobia. Kenny embodies contemporary white America. He is pressured by economic anxiety as we see him struggling to find a job. I check out my new resume. I made it into a fold-out brochure. By a sense of social dislocation. That's where I usually sit. And most strongly, by aggrieved entitlement. Oh, that bee is living my life! This all explains his distrust and dislike for Barry. But when Kenny is driven to attempted murder, <laughs> there's one more factor at play, dehumanization. Why is your life any more valuable than mine? Well, that's exactly what I'm remembering. Kenny has been conditioned by society to see bees as subhuman. He's been trained to casually accept killing them, 
as evidenced by his flippant and remorseless attempts to murder Barry. These are winter boots! This is not a product of Kenny's own mind, but of his society. The humans in this world have believed that they are the only sentient, cognizant species because that's what they've been told. The bees! The bees are here! Ah! Master Reynolds! Master Reynolds! The bees! The bees are in the garden! Go use the insect spray! But if you spray the flowers, you'll harm the bees! Just get rid of them! Stop spraying! The bees will be harmed! Vanessa oh, is surprised oh, when sorry. Barry talks. That is, because despite the fact that bees and all insects, as far as the film exhibits, have always had the ability to speak alongside complex technology and social structure, humans apparently haven't even considered this to be a possibility. It's mentioned a few times in the film that bees don't talk to humans as a rule. However, is it really possible that millions of bee colonies have been held captive and exploited for honey by human beekeepers without one bee ever raising an objection or demonstrating intelligence? I don't think so. <laughs> Moreover, it's not just insects, but ostensibly all animals who demonstrate equal capacity for sentience. In the closing scene of the film, we see a cow lamenting the exploitation of her labor by the dairy industry. A dairy industry that, as far as we can interpret, has also kept the sentience of cattle a secret from the public. And that is the disturbing, implicit message of the film. There is no plausible way that the honey industry was unaware of the bee's sentience. Rather, the rest of humanity remained ignorant precisely because the honey industry needed them to. This is an unholy perversion of the balance of nature, Benson. You'll regret this. By keeping bees and other animals dehumanized and silent in the public opinion, companies manipulated humanity into accepting the exploitation and killing of other sentient species. Living out our lives as honey slaves to the white man! When we replace honey with oil and bees with the Middle East, it's clear how this conflict serves as a direct allegory for the Iraq War. Through the allegorical narrative of B-movie, Jerry Seinfeld forces corporate America to confront its agency and injustice and makes the general public face its complacency in accepting the injustices perpetuated by its own country. Hi, I'm Jerry Seinfeld and I'm making a movie about bees. My movie bees talk, they drive cars, they watch television. In Kenny, white America sees itself reflected in that reflection as something ugly. The viewer is forced to reconcile the fact that even if Kenny's fears are accurate, even if his privilege and status are threatened, murder is never justified. Kenny's willingness to kill is something instilled in him by the power centers, but it is also something that demands correction. Moreover, when Barry achieves restorative justice and precipitates complete environmental collapse, he alone receives not only the blame, but also the onus of fixing the problem. Solutions to the fallout of an unjust system should not be the sole responsibility of that system's victims. The film ends with an extremely unrealistic montage. The bees rapidly spread pollen and revitalize all plants, which, aside from not being how plants work, is also not how pollen works. What should be the cathartic resolution of conflict in the film's arc devolves into what is easily the least believable component of the narrative. This angers the viewer, as it should, echoing the absurdist anti-colonialist critiques seen at the end of Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. The film's climactic moment of hope is unbelievable in order to make a statement. By forcing the viewer to reject a rapid and simple resolution, Seinfeld in turn makes the viewer admit the abject difficulty of positive change. B-Movie is not an environmentalist film, okay? If that were the point, they could have just given us the Lorax for half the cost and spent the other $75 million on renewable energy or birds or some shit. 
B movie is not hopeful. It's not uplifting. It isn't a comedy. B movie is punishment. One we deserved and one we failed to learn from. I'm sorry I got a little heated, but when people say it's the same as Atlas Shrugged, I get really angry. Anyway, yeah, that's why we still need communism. Bye.